Praise God. He is so good. Give me a moment to get my things situated here. Matthew chapter 3, going to talk to you tonight from the perspective of John the Baptist. We're open with that, but want to talk to you about something tonight that I feel is, it's a teaching point. So we're going into teaching tonight. Again, keep Pastor Blankenship in prayer. He is at our CSB meeting for Norfolk City, and uh, I'm so proud of him that he is He's our pastor, and he's representing not just us, but the community, the city, uh, in that. Amen. I believe God puts us in places for great things. I was talking to one of our graduates just the other day, and uh, from Indian River, it's, uh, I'm probably going to say her name wrong, but uh, Marisa, I think is her name. I'm looking at her. She's, She's waiting for a ride over there. Uh, with the others outside, but uh, she is going to New York, to a university in New York for theater and arts, and it's a small world because I've been reaching out to my neighbor who is the retired Commodore of the police department from Precinct 2 many years, and he's in a hospital and has leukemia, but I was talking to him Saturday, and his granddaughter, his only granddaughter, is going to the same college for the same thing. It's a small world. Maybe we can say that, you know. It's a good God is what I think. God orchestrates everything for His purpose. So I, I just thank the Lord that, you know, there's, there's so many things that just are intertwined and we don't always see what the Lord is doing. I was giving somebody a a pictorial teaching lesson with an aid, and, and I said, you know, sometimes we, we look around and we're looking at things, and I, I took a little globe, a little ball I had, and I, I did something like this. I took my pen. Let me do this so I don't spill all the water of the world on me. I took my pen, and I said, you know, where we are, we try to see things around us, and in the scope of the world, we are right there. And yet God knows everything about us. We don't know, in the scope of everything, we don't know squat. (laughs) I mean, really, we, we, we are right there. And we might see a little something around us. But in the scope of the world, it's, it's just a drop. It's just like a drop in the ocean. But God One songwriter said, he holds the whole world in his hand. You know, we're in his hand. He said, nobody can take us from his hand. Aren't you glad that God protects you? Amen. Watches over you and keeps you. Jesus said, you're in my father's hand and nobody can take you from it because I and my father are one. Amen. Let's get into the Bible. Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Another translation says, I can't even pick them up and carry them. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Everybody say, with fire. fire. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He's going to take a winnowing fork and he's going to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's going to put the wheat in the barn or gather the wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Everybody say, with fire. Amen. So tonight I want to speak to you on just a little bit on the subject of good fire, bad fire. Good fire, bad fire. Would you sit down? Or you may be seated. Would Would you sit down? I don't know. I've I've had quite a month, I gotta tell you. I looked at the video the other night of saying something to my daughter and I was like, man, I was like, dude, when we redo that, I look like I was asleep. 
I just hope I pronounce things right tonight. <laughs> you know, so there's pros and cons of fire, you know? Fire gives us what? Warmth, heat, light. What can we do with it? We can cook. We can barbecue. Man, now, you know, somebody's, <laughs> somebody said, now we're cooking with peanut oil. <laughs> By the way, have you ever had a turkey fried in peanut oil? Amen. Man, that is great eating. It, it just seals in the juices from the inside and the out. And it doesn't matter. My son-in-law and I, Tony and I, did one one year, and my family was here, and his family was here, and we put that baby out back in, in some oil and cooked it. And when we got done, we, we had put all this Cajun season. I mean, we stuck it so many times, injected all that seasoning. We wanted to make sure it had enough. We took it out. It looked like blackened turkey. But I tell you what, you cut into that thing, and it was so moist and tender. But, you know, those things can get out of hand, too. How many of you have seen videos where people drop them in too fast, or they're still frozen, or there's water in it, and it just boils over, catches the propane, the propane gas fire, catches on fire from all the oil, burns down the garage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there we have the cons. You know, too much light can hinder our sleep. People who live in Alaska have this problem. They go into depression in, in, in the winter months, in the colder months, because it gets dark, but it's not exactly dark. And, and they're trying to sleep, and, and then, you know, it's, it's like that. So it's, it can hinder your sleep if you have too much light. Too much heat can cause a fire, or we can be burned. If we're not careful, we'll burn down the house. I don't know if me and my brothers were just... Man, maybe, I don't want to say we didn't get out because it always seemed like mom was chasing us out of the house. But maybe we didn't get to do much because we were fascinated with fire. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, we learn what's good and bad about fire. We learn what's correct. We have to learn it. What's correct? What's incorrect? What's, what's a good use and a bad use of it? Because it can spare our lives and keep us from harm. But every generation goes through the learning process to learn that the stove is hot. I don't know if you've ever been burnt by stove. I've, I've seen people that have had scars because when they were young, they went to grab something at the stove and pull grease down on them and burn them. Uh, I've not had any situation like that. I did one time. I was... I was in the Navy, and I was on a drill team with rifles and stuff, and we were fixing to go do another gig, and I'd stayed up late one night. Somebody come in, I fell asleep on the floor. I was ironing my clothes on the floor, and fell asleep on the floor, and somebody said, hey, man, you better get up. We got a gig in the morning. Well, I sat up when I did. I put this arm, no, it was my right arm, put this arm right on the iron. It burned a patch about eight inches long and two inches wide, straight down my forearm, the whole piece of it. And it blistered, and the next day we wore, we, we had short sleeve shirts, and, you know, I was in color guard, and, and I was on this side. I was on the left side, so I carried this, and I was swinging my arm. And, I, and man, I, I begged the, our, our leader. I said, I said, Chief, please let me be on the other side today. He says, nope, we practiced this way. You're going to do that. We were in a football Hall of Fame parade in Canton, Ohio. It's over three miles long. And I can't tell you how bad it felt, not just that I was moving my arm, but that I peeled the blisters off in the first, <laughs> I don't know, in the first few hundred feet, the blisters were gone. I was rubbing raw flesh. It, it was just terrible. Fire is a terrible thing. <laughs> Brother Eli's having a laugh up there. He thinks it's funny. <laughs> but, you know, we got to learn that the stove is hot. The sun is hot. You ever see people, you know, I used to have, cousins and friends that would have these sun lamps you know what I'm talking about back in the day they'd hang them in their bedroom and they'd they'd get in their bathing suit and they'd tan you know before summer came and they'd come to school and their eyes be all swollen up their face about this big around because they got overdone you know they got sun poisoning it wasn't really the sun they got fake sun poisoning you know of course it's even worse today you know people go People go to get married, 
I had a cousin get married and somebody was in her wedding. They went to get tan and he talked about how you got to, you know, do the pose. You got to do different poses so it gets every place. Too much for me. Too much for me. But, you know, the sun is hot. We got to be careful. I, I looked on my, on my weather app last night and it said it's extremely hot. The heat index is 11. Wear sunscreen and stay in the shade. And I'm thinking, you know, why do I need sunscreen if I'm in the shade? I, I, don't, I don't know. These things, just little things amuse me sometimes. But, you know, the sun, is, really, though, the sun is hot. We have to be careful. We have to wear sunblock nowadays with a high level of SPF. Uh, even light bulbs are hot. You have to let them cool down before you take them out. There's all kinds of things we learn are hot. You can go out on the pavement, you know, go out, go out uh, on the deck, go out on the sand in the summertime. It's hot, you know. If you're like me, wear socks and shoes all the time, you can't handle that stuff. I can't handle that stuff. But remember when you were a kid? You ever play with matches when you were a kid? Got one honest man. Thank you, Brother Frank. <laughs> you know, don't play with matches, Smokey Bear said. But, you know, didn't it just fascinate you? I started to say earlier, my brother and I, we were fascinated. Well, I had an interest in it. We, we did things. We almost burnt the house down more than one time. Uh, but my brother, he was, he was a pyro guy, you know. He'd be the kind of guy that would, you know, we found it. He, he'd be the kind of guy that would find a box of matches. I don't, I don't mean a little box. I mean one of them big 500 count ones, you know. And, and the nice ones were the strike anywheres, you know. You know, that's what we need to be as Christians. We need to be, we don't need to have to have something to strike on all the time. Not the box. We don't have to come to church to be able to strike on the box, you know, to strike on the box. We can just strike anywhere, you know. We can, we can go out in town and strike. We can be on fire without having anything else because we've got the fire in us. He said, I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. My brother used to take those matches and, and when we go down to what we call the farm or any place, man, it didn't have to be very far away, you would find a line of matches cooked. And he'd line them babies up about an inch apart like dominoes. And then he'd cluster a whole bunch of them together. And you can imagine he's like, <laughs> he'd be like, wow. We do some crazy things with fire. One day I was, you know, I didn't grow up in church and I smoked. And one day we, I was sitting in, in the living room and it was hot outside. And, and Dad had just put in the air conditioner and me and my brother were laying in, in the living room. I was laying on the couch and he was laying on the floor. And I had a lighter and I was just a little big lighter. I was just, you know, just the sparks. Not, not wasting my, my butane, you know, just. My brother's laying there and I just. He had thick hair. Started right about here. Just starts crawling up his head like this. And I'm like, Whew. blew it out, man. And I just kind of laid back. My dad comes walking through and he says, he says, boys, get up and help me check these heaters. I think one of them's on. We had electric baseboard heat. He thought we were wasting money because it was on while the air conditioner was on. I'm telling you, it didn't take two seconds. My brother, my brother sits up and he goes, <laughs> I can't repeat what he said. But we used to do stuff like that all the time. We were just fascinated with fire, you know, always get in trouble. I tell you lots more stories, but we got a Bible study, <laughs> you know. How about, how about when you're young, you'd, you'd take matches and you'd flick them, you know, whether on a pack or on a box, you know. Just take them and flick them, you know, they, they catch on fire, you know. It, it was cool. Sulfur's cool stuff. Had a friend would just, he, he'd take a bottle and he'd cut all the tips off of those Strike Anywhere matches and stuff them in a bottle and then he'd screw the top on. And if you didn't do it just right, man, boom, you know. It, it was kind of like a little bomb type thing, you know. It'd shatter the glass. But just... You know, when you're young, you do dumb stuff. We were young. We were dumb. We were ignorant. We were idiots. 
That's a word that's come back in my vocabulary. I see lots of people that just, oh, man. I, oh, never mind. Never mind. I, I better not get into it. Let's, let's get back to our Bible study. But, you know, we flick, we flick those matches, and sometimes we flick them at each other, you know, and we, we get little burns on us and things, you know. Why? Because we were childish. We were too immature to understand how much hurt it could cause or scars for life, you know. And sometimes what's funny when you're a kid is really not funny to the people on the other end of it. You know, fire's dangerous. So there is good fire, and there's bad fire. Now, there's all kinds of fire, you know. Um, and because there's bad fire, when we grow up, that's why we put away. When I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, we stopped doing childish things, foolish things, you know. There's also another type of fire. It's called gunfire. Fire in combat. There's enemy fire. It's where the enemy's shooting at you. You're expecting that. You're shooting back. Sometimes there's friendly fire where you get caught up in a fire or in a crossfire of somebody that's on your side. And there's a misfire. A misfire is when you shoot your gun, but it doesn't go off. And that round that's in the chamber can become, is no longer a good fire. And hopefully it doesn't become a bad fire by trying to eject it. You have to do it very carefully, very slowly. Something didn't go right, whether with the gun or with the ammunition. But you have to be very careful in taking it out. The gun master is not there to do it for you. If you're on a shooting range, a gun master, the range master will come and do it for you normally. But you have to be careful. But, you know, even when it's the equipment's fault, that's still our responsibility as a soldier. In a time of war, the range master is not there to do it for you, but always remember the instructions you learned. I, I, I want to go into James chapter 4. And the reason I'm going there is because James talks about the fire of the tongue. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation, just to give a little difference on it here. And this is one thing I find hard when I do a Bible study, is that when I find a verse or verses that it is so hard to just cut away the other stuff around it because it's not like a piece of burger. It's not like a piece of steak. You cut the fat off the edges, you know. The Word of God, you know, every word of God is for our benefit, you know. Every word of God is for us. So it's, it's difficult for me sometimes to just do away with it. So I'm going to try to be brief in these readings, but I've got a couple of them tonight that I'm going to read more than just a couple of verses. Here's one of them in James chapter 4. From the New Living Translation. Hey, they got it. Great. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires at war within you? We're talking about friendly fire. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill and get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war. There's that word again, to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. You know, there's, there's a lot of things to be learned in just what we would have just read. Because if we would learn to ask God and wait on God. You know, sometimes, a lot of times with God, the answer is not yes or no, it's wait. You know? You know, a lot of times we get the word, let me think about it. You know, some people go away so discouraged, you know. My brothers and I, when my dad said, let me think about it, it was like, he didn't say no. That's a baby. He might have been thinking no the whole time, but you know what? We took it, we took it as it's not a no yet. Even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Notice the term that the Apostle James, he's the pastor, he's the elder at the church in Jerusalem, and notice what his response was the word he uses you adulterers don't you realize that the friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God I say it again if you want to be a friend of the world you make yourself an enemy of God James uses the term adulterers an immoral act as ones 
to, compared to ones that would fight amongst each other in the church. Folks, we're in the same boat. If we're a sinner without grace, then we're no better than them if we have grace and we sin. Do you think this do you think the scriptures mean What do you think the scriptures mean when they say that the spirit of God has placed within us filled with envy but he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires as the scriptures say God opposes the proud but favors the humble So humble yourselves before God resist the devil and he will flee from you. Oh, let's just go. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Again, notice it comes again. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's laws. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone who gave the law is judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? We have to be careful in what we do. We have to be careful in things that we say, especially about each other, you know. Everybody say this, I, I am, am a child of God. You know what that means? That means that God has chosen you by the spirit of adoption. God has chosen you and given you the new birth, the baptism of the Holy Ghost that comes with fire, with power. He said in Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Some versions say you will receive power when you receive the Holy Ghost. But let's defer back to our first verse. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Again, we're talking about good fire and bad fire. See, I'd rather be born in the fire than die in the fire. I'd rather begin my new life with fire than in my old one with fire. Are you following me? I'm talking about walking with God or I'm talking about ending up in hell. Can I, can, can I give you a hint? Your flesh is not going to heaven. Your flesh is not going to heaven. We do so much to pamper our flesh and to get our way. It's all right if it's quiet. I know you're listening. <laughs> we do so much to pamper our flesh or to get our way in so many things. But our flesh isn't going to heaven. But let me tell you what does happen. God uses the Holy Ghost fire to preserve the good and to burn off the bad. In our opening verses, it's, you'll find the same in... Uh, it was in Matthew chapter 3. You'll find almost identical words in Luke chapter 3. Then you'll find similar words in Mark chapter 1 and in John chapter 1. But he's talking about giving us the fire that comes along with the Holy Ghost. And then he's talking about anything that is not worth or has no value. Anything that is worthless in the kingdom will be burned off. Now, I'm not talking about individuals. That's, that's not what he's saying. What God wants to do, he said, a house is built. Paul said a house is built, and there is 
there's uh, they're, they're built of wood and stone and stubble, some of gold and silver and so on, all the way down to wood, hay, and stubble. And it says that fire will burn away all that that will not stand. You know the story of the three little pigs. But instead of huffing and puffing, you know, the old wolf might be huffing and puffing, but, you know, it's fire. It's, and a lot of times when we go through things, we think it's the devil. We think it's Satan. There are times that he's messing with us. But I'm telling you, folks, a lot of times it is God trying to burn the junk out of our life, trying to burn away the chaff. Our opening scripture, the the Lord is taking in his harvest. He uses a winnowing fork just to stir it up and all the heavy grain falls out. And then it is all the light stuff is the waste. It's swept away and to be burned in a fire. Because God doesn't want anything to do with it. It's, it's useless. It's, it's gone. And there is that in each one of us. In each one of us, there is, we need good fire to burn in us. I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. Go with me in Malachi chapter 3. In the King James, it reads, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. That's John the Baptist. This is what we were reading from John the Baptist in Matthew 3. And John was talking about Jesus coming, and here it's talking about the Lord coming. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Now this is a one God scripture. Okay? God is coming in the flesh to see his temple in Jerusalem. Okay? Even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. There it is again. It's God showing up. Now you ready for the questions? Verse 2. But who may abide in the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Now this is also talking parallel with the end time when the Lord's coming back. Listen, he's going he's gonna to be a refiner and he's going to have it like the fuller's soap. Now a fuller's soap is one that washes, it bleaches, it cleanses, makes it white. And that's what God wants. He wants us to have, be prepared and be dressed in robes that are white, that are spotless, without wrinkle or blemish, because we're his bride. But you know what he's going to do? He's a refiner, and he's the fuller. What he's going to do, he's going to heat things up, and he's going to clean things up. Okay? Verse 3, And he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi. You know who the sons of Levi are? When you, when, you, when you look in the tabernacle plan, the sons of Levi are the ones who prepare everything for and in service for the temple, for the church, or for the tabernacle, later for the temple, for the building. Whenever it had to be picked up and moved, it was the Levites that took it and moved it. We are like sons of Levi. We are like Levites. There is, there is the Aaronic priesthood, just Aaron, but the Levites and all those were the ones, there were many more of those that took care of all kinds of other things in ministering to the Lord. Okay? And so God wants to purge us. He said, purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now, God wants to purify us. He wants to purge us. You know, there's, um, there's a story, if you've heard about it, about the refiner from Jeremiah chapter 6 and chapter 7. And in Jeremiah chapter 6, the Lord is purifying. He gets in front of the fire. There's, there's a lady who went to a silversmith, and he's making something. He's describing how he does his work. He's not doing it right now. He's just describing it. And he says, we melt, I melt this silver, and then I scrape off any impurities. And she said, and the lady asked the question, she said, is there, is there a possibility that you can overheat it 
he said yes. See, there's a boiling point to all kinds of things. We know there's a, there's a melting point, you know, for water. Well, there's a boiling point for water, you know, 32 and 212. Well, there's the same thing for all the elements. And the silversmith said, yes, if I don't keep an eye on it, it can burn up as well. And she says, do you, when do you know when that point is? Do, are you close enough to see what's going on? He says, yes, when the process is happening, I sit right in front of the fire. And I can tell because I know it's pure when I can see myself in it, in the reflection. And so God wants to see his reflection in us. You know, they came to Jesus with a coin and they said, they said, you know, do we owe Caesar taxes or what do we do? Who's, and, and Jesus said, give me a coin. He says, whose inscription is on it? They said, Caesar's. Then he said, render unto Caesar's what's Caesar's and render unto God what's God's. We need to be to the point to where when we're melted, even if you take a penny, a penny's copper. Copper takes some high temperature, like 1,600 degrees to the melting point. And it takes that much to do that, but they heat it up and they stamp it, and it has an impression on it. You pull a coin out of your pocket today, one thing it's going to say is, in God we trust. I'm so thankful I can pull something out of my pocket and still have hope. <laughs> Listen, America is still the greatest nation on earth. It's the greatest place to live on earth. There's no freedoms or anything else like we have in America. And part of that freedom is to live our lives in freedom and to have the liberty to worship God as we do. In God we trust. But, you know, we need to be that way. We need the impression. We need to let God heat us up. We need Him to have His impression on us. Instead of the world pressing on us, we need to get away from the place of God and let Him impress us so that His image shines to those around us. Can you say amen? So that they will know in God we trust. Let's go to Mark chapter 9. There's so much in here. I, I have it beginning at verse 38, but we're going to skip down to verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter into life maimed. And he's not talking about this life. He's talking about eternal life. Then having two hands and go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Remember the beginning, unquenchable fire? And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter and halt into life than having two feet and be cast, to be cast into hell, into the fire that shall, there I do it again, that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Verse 47, and if thine eye Offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes and be cast into the fire, into hell fire. All times in verse 43, 45, and 47, it talks about the fire of hell. That's Gehenna. Gehenna was a place called uh, south of Jerusalem. It's called the Valley of Hinnon. It's also called the Son of Hinnon when you go back and look at it originally. And it is the place where in Jerusalem they would take their trash to be burned. They would take dead, the carcasses of dead animals and so forth. They would take those things there and they would burn them. As a matter of fact, it's on the south side of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. And if you're, if you're rich... In Israel, you're buried on the Mount of Olives because you're looking at the temple. God's going to come and land when he comes. He's going to set foot where the temple mount is. And the Bible says that the, the, the people rise out of their graves, and they will be looking. Those, there's so many graves on the Mount of Olives looking right at the temple. But over here is a place where the poor people are buried. It's next to hell. It's next to Gehenna. It's next to the dump 
where they burn everything. But notice the wording. Verse 48, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. I'm telling you, there's, there's so many things in the Bible that, that come together. But it relates back to, uh, if you want to look at it later, it relates back to uh, the last recordings of Isaiah in, in chapter 66, uh, the last words of that prophet. Hell is a place of future punishment called Gehenna, or Gehenna of fire. This was originally the valley of Hinnon, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. It's a fitting symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. You know, had Joseph of Arimathea not given the tomb for Jesus, Jesus would have been born or buried out there close to this. But in verses 44, 46, and 48, where it says, Their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, many manuscripts read, Where the maggots never die, and the fire never goes out. Why are there maggots? Because there are dead carcasses, because there's trash burning, because it's a dump. And flies come and lay their eggs. And that's how you get maggots. Now, in the New Testament, uh, you know, there's, there's somebody in the Bible called the Lord of the Flies. In the New Testament, people, Jesus was casting out devils, and they came and they called him and said, He does this by the power of Beelzebub. Beelzebub goes back to an Ekron term in which, well, let me... Uh, Thayer's lexicon tells us Beelzebub is one of the names of Satan, the princes of evil spirits. It's a Chaldee or Chaldean origin, meaning the dung god. No wonder there's flies. Okay? Second Kings actually records it that he's Beelzebub, the god of Ekron. Tell you how bad Israel fell during their time is that the king at that time in Second Kings chapter 2, I'm sorry, Second Kings, I believe it's Chapter 1, verse 2, called for the priest to go to the temple of Beelzebub and inquire for him, the dung god. You know, I'm so glad that even when God tests us, he knows what we can bear. He knows how much we can endure, you know. To the Ekronites, he was known as the Lord of the Flies. But, you know, I'm so thankful that our God is known as the Good Shepherd, He's the good shepherd. He cares for his sheep. Matter of fact, in Psalms 23, verse 5, we, we know the shepherd's psalm so much. And in verse 5, it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You know, God, we can live peaceably anywhere. We can, we can live in the bounty of God, be fed, be taken care of, and live godly anywhere. Notice what he says next. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. God just, just blesses us so much. But the, the interesting part is thou anointest my head with oil. He's talking about the shepherd and the sheep. Do you know why he anointed the head? The shepherd anointed the head of the sheep. It's because the sheep would eat and, and they would only follow the shepherd. And if you leave them to themselves, they just wander off. My mother lived on a farm, and her, her worst thing, she would rather get in a chicken house and pick up eggs and clean out the bins in the afternoon than deal with the sheep. She called them snotty-nosed animals. But sheep walk along. They really don't even look around. They're, they're, they're not aware. You know, most animals will, will birds, all kinds of things, will, will usually look around, see what's happening, you know? Not sheep. They're just looking for food. They're just milling along. And when they do that, you know, other sheep are around them, other things are around them, and they run their nose, their, their head through somebody else's pile, through dung. And what comes with that? Bugs, maggots. And a shepherd 
those 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 things would get in and into the ears and the nostrils of the sheep and they would drive them nuts that they would just they'd beat their head on wood trying to get them out on on trees or scrape them on the ground they'd hurt themselves trying to get rid of that and the shepherd the good shepherd would pour oil on their head so that if the bugs got on there they couldn't grab a hold of and stick to it Aren't you glad you're anointed with the Holy Ghost? You know, there's a bunch of junk that we're spared because God looks out for us. My head is anointed with oil. Let's pray right now. God, anoint our heads. God, our minds, Lord, the things that the world throws at us, God. But, Lord, it's the anointing of the Holy Ghost in our lives, God. Oh, God, you purify us and you keep us, God. Thank you for your goodness. I jumped out of Mark 9. I'm going to jump back for just a couple of verses. Verse 49. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. That sounds kind of weird, but what it's saying is everybody's going to be salted with fire, or everybody's going to be tested with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltness, wherewith will you season it? Have salt in yourselves, and have peace one with another. In other words, a trying of our faith is going to happen inside of us. The Holy Ghost is going to work inside of us. Not just here. A lot of times we talk about God. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost, you know. We need it here. <laughs> we need it here. And have peace with one another. Notice that. And have peace with one another. Yeah, we're salt, we're light, but what about peace? Peace with one another. Folks, if there's any place we've got to have peace, we've got to have it in the house. We've got to have it in the house of God. We've got to have it in our families. We've got to pray for that. 1 Thessalonians 5.13 says, To esteem them very highly for their work's sake. That's talking about the ministry. But next it says, And be at peace among yourselves. Isn't it interesting that in the following verses are the verses that we know so well because they're so easy? You know them. Come on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. How about rejoice evermore? Pray without ceasing. <laughs> in everything give thanks. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold on to that which is good and do not appear to be evil. Those are the easy verses of the Bible besides Jesus wept. When I was a kid in the Baptist church, every year we had VBS, we had people that would memorize scriptures and whoever memorized the most won something big like a bike. The pastor had a son named, I forget his name. The pastor had a son with an odd name. Anyway. But he would always learn all the easy scriptures like this. But, you know, before Paul said all these things, which are very important, rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, give thanks for everything, quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold on to that which is good, and avoid the appearance of evil. He wrote, be at peace among yourselves. Peace is one of the first things we need in our life. Peace is not an addition to the house. It's part of the foundation. He is the Prince of Peace. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And if He is the chief cornerstone, if everything is built on Him and the apostles and prophets, peace ought to be in our very foundation. He wrote, be at peace among yourselves. Everybody's going to be tested. Oh, really? You know, we just graduated a bunch of kids, and some of them are going to go to college, and yeah, it's going to be a different experience, but <laughs> they still got writing. They still got testing. They're still going to be graded. You know what? You know what we don't like sometimes? We don't like to be corrected. Isn't it true? We don't like to be corrected. Nobody likes to be corrected. But don't you want to be correct? <laughs> you know, so many times Jesus said, what say ye? What say ye? You know, they say this, they say this. What do you say? God cares about our opinion. You know why? Because He wants us to have the right answer. He wants us to be correct. And oftentimes He corrected 
his disciples because they gave the wrong answer or he told them you don't have enough faith or you have little faith you you're you're unbelieving a lot of times the answers weren't right or wrong it was the motive behind it was it wrong for the mother of James and John to come along and say give them seats beside you in glory he said do you know what you're asking <laughs> can they drink the cup I'm gonna drink can they handle it I, we don't hear any more from mama James and John became two of the greatest apostles. Let me take you to Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 17. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, the house of Israel is to me become dross. All, the, all they are brass and tin and iron and lead in the midst of the furnace they are even dross of silver. So all this other stuff, even though they can be good components, good things for different things, you know, we're talking about during the Bronze Age, the time of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, was declared the Bronze Age. Do you know what bronze is made out of? Bronze is made out of, see if I can remember this, <laughs> brass and tin, I believe. Is what bronze is made out of. And he's saying that. They are brass and tin and iron. That leads us into the next stage, which was the Romans. And lead in the midst of the furnace. They are even dross of silver. They don't belong in you. You know what he's saying? He's saying, get the world out of you. He's saying, even the strength of the world is weakness in my presence. Get, get it out of you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, verse 19, Because you are all become dross, behold, therefore I will gather you in the midst of Jerusalem. And as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, so will I gather you in my anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Folks, that is bad fire. That's past God dealing with us. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. As silver is melted in the midst of the furnace, so shall ye be melted in the midst thereof, and ye shall know that I, the Lord, have poured my fury out on you. You, you know what I read from this when it talks about the brass and the tin and the iron? And what's the other component there? The lead. It takes on a whole new meaning of get the lead out. Don't mean just hurry up. A lot of times that's what gets us in trouble. We're hurrying up all the time. We need to wait on God and let God do it His way. But we have to, we have to understand that, you know, it takes process. In the process of time. We read that over and over in the Bible. In the process of time. Time. He makes all things beautiful in His time. Get the lead out. Hebrews 12 even tells it. Wherefore, seeing we're compassed with about... With so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run the race with patience. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So he's saying, get the lead out. Even in the New Testament, get the lead out. You know what? Lead melts at 621 degrees. Or, or that's the, yeah, that's the melting point. You know what silver is? It's over 1,000 degrees more. It's 1760 so when God gets the silver to where he can see us, it's already burnt out. Lead at 621, tin at 450, brass at 1710. Even though brass is tough, it's not as high as silver. And gold is even more. Gold is 1,945 degrees Fahrenheit as a melting point. So the Bible, when you, when you read the Bible and it talks about for the, the tabernacle and for the temple, and it talks about... How many talents? I, I think it was, I'm trying to remember for the temple, it was like a thousand talents of gold and 10,000 talents or 100,000 talents of refined silver. It wasn't just silver. The silver had to be pure. 
You know, it's interesting when we when we think about holiness and stuff like that, if it even matters, you know, because it isn't it interesting in the plan of the tabernacle and in the plan of the temple that, you know, we we teach modesty and distinction about being covered, that all the beauty in the tabernacle and all the beauty in the temple was not on the outside. And the temple was just stone on the outside of sandstone because that's what's Abundant there. But the gold and silver was all on the inside. In the tabernacle, the outside was covered with, with uh, you, you had the, the tabernacle within. And the holiest of holies and the holy place and in the tabernacle. And all the stuff that was there was all inside of the tent. And the tent had, there are certain parts that had scarlet, uh, purple, curtains and silver rings and all that kind of stuff but it was all covered with badger skins who <laughs> you know i don't know much about furs but i don't think i've ever heard you know i've heard of people wearing fox and even a rabbit but badger i had never heard of that but god shows it on the outside because it's, it's not the outside that matters he said he comes and he's not even comely to look on the lord wasn't some handsome dude because he didn't come for that purpose. The purpose he came for was the, pure, the purity that was within. It was that pure blood that was within. And that's what God wants to do with us. The outside we worry so much about, but it's the inside that God wants to purify. And make like unto him. Hmm. I got a bunch of scriptures, but I'm just going to read certain ones. Psalm 66 and 10. For thou, O God, has proved us. Thou hast tried us as silver is tried. Remember the story in Daniel chapter 3? I was going to read some of it. I don't have time. In Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there's a, there's a huge golden image set up for Nebuchadnezzar, and they had to bow down when they heard the music play. And they wouldn't do it. And the king come over and said, you know, now these weren't just strangers. Because if you go back in the chapter before, when Daniel was risen up in place as the governor, he sat at the king's gate or in the king's court, and these men were governors over provinces in Babylon. They weren't nobodies. They weren't just, when they, when they continued to stand, oh yeah, it was a setup. And let me tell you, folks, in life, people are going to set you up. The enemy, Satan, Beelzebub, is going to set you up. But stand. Having done all but to stand, stand, Paul said. And so these men stood, and they took them, and they, they threw them in. He said, he said, why don't you bow? He says, because we can't bow to you. There's only one God to bow to. And, you know, you think Nebuchadnezzar would have got that. Because in just a few verses before, now, of course, it's not, you know, like yesterday and today. It might be a few years, a few drinks or whatever, you know. But, you know, in the Bible, it's not, it's not even a page away. And he had declared God to be the God of all gods and to give honor and to lift him up and nobody declare anything against God. And here's some boys standing for God, but they didn't do what he wanted him to, them to do. Listen, anytime you use manipulation or fear or intimidation, you're not godly. It's not God's way. That's Satan's way. Satan uses fear. Fear hath torment. And he tries to intimidate them. What's he do? He heats the furnace seven times. One version says seven times hotter than it could handle. We know the story, but... Let me just read you a couple of scriptures. Psalms 12, 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver is tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. These boys were going through the purification process. I don't mean they were being sanctified. They were already living that way. And they didn't even have the Holy Ghost by their choices. Verse 7 says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I'm telling you, when you make a stand for God, He's not just got your back today. 
<laughs> Isaiah 125, And I will turn my hand upon thee and will purely purge away thy dross and take away thy tin. <laughs> I don't have time. God is in the business. God is in the furnace business. He's in the fire business. He's not a fireman. He doesn't put them out. He uses them for his purpose. Whether we allow him to use it by the power of the Holy Ghost or by the power of the Holy Spirit to change us, or whether we don't allow that, we make choices contrary to it, and he uses it to destroy us in the end. But remember, the fire is there like in Gehenna. The worm dieth not. We have a soul that does not die. But we have a God that always lives. God's purpose is not for us to be destroyed by fire, but to be saved by fire. Can you say amen? Let, let me just touch base on this. Psalms 34. Uh, I will bless. No, we know this because we used to sing this as a chorus. Some of us older folks know this as a chorus. We sang, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will pray. Let me back up. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. Isn't that wonderful? And delivered me from all my fears. You know what we do in life? We get in a situation and say, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this situation. Sometimes we're there because we got ourselves there. <laughs> we got ourselves there and we're asking God, get me out of this. But he said he would, he would deliver us from all of our fears. He didn't come to deliver us from our situations. He didn't come to deliver us from our tests and our trials. He came to deliver us from evil. He came to deliver us from our fears. Because fear hath torment. The enemy tries to mess with our mind through torment, through fears. But once we get the fear out, we, we're not afraid anymore. There's not that torment. How many of you have been burned before? I, I, I'm talking physically. I, I don't mean monetarily, your friends or anything. I mean physically burned a match. I, I mentioned an iron, a stove, whatever. You, you've been burned. Maybe you got a scar. But you know what? Today you don't, you're not afraid of fire. You cook with fire. You turn on your heater at home, it works by fire. You drive your car that works by internal combustion. That's big time fire. You know why? Because you're not ignorant. It's because you've learned what's good fire and what's bad fire. And in our life with God, we've got to realize that God has good fire that will put us to the test. We'll try our faith. Will you stand? The enemy tries to mess with our mind through fears. Remember what I told you about Beelzebub and about things that get into the, the heads of sheep. You know, David said in Psalms 56, Be merciful unto me, O God, for man would swallow me up. He fighting daily oppresseth me. I mean, you ever had stuff you had to deal with with people? Somebody said, you know, this business wouldn't be bad for all, if it wasn't for all the people. My enemies would daily swallow me up, for they be many that fight against me, O thou most high. Then David makes an interesting declaration in Psalms 56, verse 3. He says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. 
I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all of my fears. When I'm afraid, I can go to the Lord and he can give me peace. It's, it's God. You know, First Peter said, The trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found into the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. It's God's holy fire that works in us all the time. Do you feel like this, the pressure just doesn't let up? You just need peace. You, you, you feel like there's, there's just, you know, something's hot on your trail. You, you feel like, man, I can't handle the heat. I want to get out of the kitchen. No, folks, don't throw in a towel now. Now's not the time to throw in the towel. I was reading something this week, and, and just in my reading, I read that, I don't even know if I can remember it exactly, but I read that it talked about how the increase was before the Lord came, before the king came into the house. I have to find it. And I read that and I thought, you know, that is so true about the end time. God is bringing people into the church. God is, there are, there are countless, and I say countless because we don't have a count of them. I don't mean it's unmeasurable. I just mean we don't know how much God's doing. People that are being baptized in Jesus' name. People that are receiving the Holy Ghost by thousands. And many we don't even have reports of, but many we do have reports of. I'm telling you, God is per thoroughly purging His floor. But it's not about getting rid of us. It's about getting rid of Egypt in us. That was the children of Israel's problem. They came out of Egypt, but Egypt didn't come out of them. They wanted to go back to what they had. Folks, we can't go back now. We can't go back now. Why don't you gather into the altar just, just real quick. We're, we're just going to pray real quick. But, but I just feel to have us pray tonight because there is a presence of the Lord here. There is a purifying. The Lord's Spirit is here to purify us if we would allow Him. Father, let Your Word do its work in us. You said us. Not by anything we've done, not by any works of righteousness, but yet you said we are your righteousness in God. God, we are the breastplate of righteousness that we take, God, is because of the love that you've given for us. My God, my God. Thoroughly purge your floor, Lord. Lord, make us more like you. Impress us with your image that others can see. Purify us that they can see you in us, God. Oh, God. As even in the night we can look at the moon and know that the sun still shines because of the reflection. Let the world see. You in us, God. Your light in us. Oh, my God, my God. Purify me, Lord. Make me like you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you're wonderful. You're wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, Jesus. If we would just have the same passion to live for God that we had when we had in the world to live. We couldn't wait for school to be out for the day or for the week. Or work to be over or the weekend come. We live for the weekend. You know? We'd live for Friday and Saturday and Sunday and it wasn't in the house of God. We live just to just go do our own thing. Why don't we have that kind of passion in the church? 
Paul was a great example. Paul passionately pursued others because he thought he was doing right and even killed people. And yet the same man was changed in one visitation by God. If you think you can't be changed in the presence of God, you haven't read the same Bible I'm reading. Saul, who was like a dictator, taking down people, hailing saints. That means beating them. Putting them in prison to be killed. Standing by when others did it. When they, when they bludgeoned them, because that's what stoning is. Stoning is not standing 100 yards away and throwing pebbles. It's taking a rock that fits your hand well and bludgeoning somebody. Paul stood by and ordered all this, orchestrated it all. And yet the same hate, he thought he was doing right. Because those people were different than us. That's usually what gets us in trouble. And yet in one visitation from God, everything changed. We need a scale falling off our eye type of visitation. We need to knock us off our own horse type of visitation. We need to see him and say, who are you? You're Lord Jesus. Or he said, I am Jesus. Lift your hands right now. God, touch our eyes. Touch our minds. Touch our hearts, God. More than touch us, God, but heal us. Give us revelation of what you really do, Lord, in our lives. Of our purpose, God, that you have for us. That we would be busy about your business as you were. That we, be, 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 that we would be busy in the kingdom of God. Oh, God, for your glory, God. It just takes one visitation. God, visit us, Lord. Come to us, oh, God. We've called upon you. Oh Lord, he There's some of you that have laid on your bed at night. I don't even know who I'm talking to, but there's some of you here tonight that have laid on your bed recently at night and you cannot sleep because you think of all the things that are happening. I'm telling you, the fire is doing its work. God's Holy Ghost fire is purging things out of us. When those times come, just be like Samuel and say, Speak, Lord, your servant heareth. Oh, God, just do your work. Blow the billows, God. Heat it up, God. I can't take it, but I know I'm in your hand. And that's the beautiful thing is that the fire gives us the illustration that we are in his hand. No man can take us from it. And God, the, 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 the refiner, comes. And when he tests the fire to see we're in the crucible, but yet his hand is below it, checking the temperature of the fire. Oh, I'm telling you, we're not. We're not out of God's hand, but we're, he's right where he wants us when the fire is on. And God's doing his perfect work in each one of us. If we'll allow him, if we'll have patience, if we'll let God work on us and do his work. Thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. Thank you for your spirit, God, in our lives. Continue to do the work in each one of us and through us, in our families, God. God, reaching to our families, reaching to lost loved ones, God. Oh, God, the young man was called a prodigal, not because he came back to you, but because he was wasteful and greedy and selfish. God, help us not to be like that. I don't want to go away to have to come back. I want to stay right with you, God. In your presence, under your wing, protect me from the fires. Oh, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. 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 I'm sorry I'm taking just a little longer tonight. Amen. Greet one.